Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, side event uh, on adaptation and uh, with co-mitigation benefits in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, as you know, the uh, uh, nature-based solutions for climate change for climate change is receiving uh, great attention because of the its uh, cost effectiveness, sustainability, easy to apply, and also the several co-benefits associated with the uh, nature-based uh, adaptation. Uh, for example, uh, it will protect the biodiversity, it will have the uh, mitigation also benefits, it will capture and store the carbon. Uh, in, besides that, it was uh, uh, good for fisheries, it will improve the fishery stock. So all of these core benefits, they are associated with the nature-based solutions as compared with the uh, for example, the engineering uh, options, or what is called gray options. So we, this is why we are going towards the uh, uh, nature-based uh, solutions. Now, uh, how is this done? As you know, we all, all what we need is to conserve the marine environment. Uh, we have to har harnessing the surfaces of the marine environment. We need to establish more protected areas. Uh, we need to reduce the stressors, and this is very important. Uh, if you, you reduce the uh, stressors from pollution, from dredging, from other activities, you will improve the vulnerability or resilience. You will improve the resilience of the uh, system against the impact of climate change. Now, in our region, in Persica region, as you know, the uh, Red Sea and Gulf of Aden is considered rich with its uh, habitat and marine life. It has, we have a mangrove, we have seagrass, we have very good coral reefs. Now all of these, they, they make the option of uh, nature-based adaptation is very valuable for us. And uh, this is why we, we selected this, uh, to, to have it as a discussion for this side event. Now in this side event, we are going to introduce to you the experience gained by uh, Persiga. Uh, we have three lectures from Persiga. It will demonstrate the activities related to uh, adaptation uh, with the co-mitigation benefits in our region. And also we will have three speakers from member states, from Saudi Arabia, from Djibouti, and from Egypt. They will also address their experience and they will share uh, their practice with us on uh, activities they uh, conducted at national level. Uh, I would like to welcome you all. Now, by the end of this uh, speakers, as I said, we have six speakers in total, three from Persiga and three from Member State. We are going to have uh, three interventions from our honorable guests here, like Dr. Uh, uh, Leah Sigart. She is the practice manager, environmental and natural resources and blue economy, Middle East and North Africa region for the, from the World Bank. She will have intervention. And, and also Dr. Ali Abu Sinna, he is the head of the Egyptian uh, environment and natural resources. He will also join us uh, in a few minutes. He will have intervention. And finally, we have intervention from Dr. Ali, uh, Dr. Uh, Hanafi, Dr. Muhammad Hanafi. He is from uh, Swiss Canal University. He is a very well uh, uh, known uh, scientist in our region. And we are happy to have all of you here. So let me not take much time. And uh, we will start with our first uh, presentation. We'll start with Dr. Ahmad Khalil. Dr. Ahmad Khalil is the uh, climate change strategy and effort. He will talk about climate change strategy and effort in the Persica region. And he is responsible for the uh, marine life uh, and climate change in Bersiga, and he's, ho he's also the director of the project section. So I will give the floor now to Dr. Ahmad. Please start. Now every speaker will have 10 minutes, okay, for, uh, to deliver his speech. Okay, please start, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ziad. Uh, 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 actually, uh, 
uh, I'm very pleased here to share uh, this Persiga, the experience of Persiga strategy and efforts addressing climate change adaptations with co-mitigation uh, with mitigation co-benefits in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden in collaboration with Persiga member states and Persiga partners in the region. Uh, firstly, the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden region is peculiar. Uh, it has distinct characteristics that favors uh, coral reef and marine biodiversity. Uh, it, but the Gulf of Aden, on the other hand, is also uh, a very rich water body with, with high primary production and fishery uh, production. Uh, so the region, uh, in generally, supports unique biodiversity, high endemism, and high, has high potential for uh, ecosystem-based uh, marine ecosystem-based adaptations and mitigation solutions, as also mentioned by Professor Zia. Uh, Bersiga is a regional organization hosted by Saudi Arabia and membered by seven member states jointly working under the legal framework of Jeddah Convention, Regional Action Plan, and we have also five protocols. So Bersiga already uh, implement uh, a, a regional program uh, components uh, with many components covering uh, capacity building, uh, fishery, aquaculture, biodiversity, protected areas, environmental monitoring, and also controlling uh, pollution from sea-based and land-based, and uh, climate, uh, environmental awareness and climate change. Persig also uh, implement, implemented and still uh, implement uh, regional projects in collaboration with, uh, with the EF uh, international partner uh, agencies and with the World Bank uh, and, and national on-ground projects, many national on-ground projects in the member states. So uh, basically, in principle, Versiga uh, programs uh, and projects represent a good basis for the climate change program strategy. So the strategic directions uh, uh, followed by Versiga was to, to, to mainstream climate change issues in existing programs and projects. Uh, for example, uh, uh, capacity building uh, climate change issues and including vulnerability assessments and monitoring of climate change parameters in the environmental monitoring uh, programs of seawater and key habitats carried out by Bersiga and also uh, uh, implement initiatives addressing ecosystem-based adaptation and mitigation solutions uh, based on the rich coral reefs and blue carbon habitats in the region, and also working on uh, strengthening resilience by reducing uh, multiple uh, local stressors from pollution and overfishing uh, in the region and other anthropogenic impacts through programs that specialize in these uh, aspects, and also including awareness and education materials on climate change issues, adaptations, and mitigations especially for marine environment in our environmental uh, uh, awareness program. For example, in the basic capacity building and regional uh, uh, coordination workshops program, uh, Bersiga uh, has uh, uh, included several regional and national workshops, more than 20 regional and national workshops in the past uh, uh, seven to 10 years. And this covered uh, various aspects of, of climate issues, including vulnerability assessment, adaptation, funding, adaptation, system-based adaptation, and mitigation options, sea, uh, uh, monitoring sea level rise assessments, and uh, also monitoring uh, and assessments of uh, ocean acidification, as well as uh, uh, other aspects concerning like uh, economic implications of uh, climate change uh, on backs on marine environment and blue carbon uh, policies and management in the region. Uh, so uh, the uh, Persica member states uh, has also prominently considered marine ecosystem based adaptation and mitigation in the first uh, submitted uh, NDCs after uh, uh, Paris uh, Convention and this uh, 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 so uh, almost all Bersiga member states has included uh, adaptations based on marine environment in their NDCs, and Saudi Arabia has also included uh, 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 mitigation uh, measures based on blue carbon, uh, and this has been further consolidated in the updated uh, NDCs by, by, by regional and national initiatives uh, 
this region. Uh, uh, some other aspects uh, on building resilience by reducing multiple stressors from pollution and fisheries, these are undertaken uh, uh, by the uh, uh, pollution, uh, uh, control of pollution from sea-based activities and control uh, of pollution from land-based activities. These two programs are run by Bersiga and they have frameworks, uh, free regional protocols, and uh, regional plans, action plans has been developed, and also Bersiga has uh, Bersiga and Marsiga Center, which uh, provide regional coordination and capacity building workshops in contingency planning, uh, pollution response, in collaboration with uh, IMO, which is based in Horgada, uh, in Egypt, and uh, in sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. Also, Bersiga has a special program uh, and, and now developing a regional protocol concerning uh, collaboration in management of sustainable fisheries and agriculture. And we have just also started uh, a, a regional project with, uh, supported by the World Bank, collaboration with the World Bank, uh, focusing on, uh, on uh, sustainable development of fisheries and agriculture in the region. Uh, also, in, in, in the area of strengthening ecosystem monitoring, protection, and restoration effort, several uh, uh, aspects of development has been uh, mainstreamed in our program, uh, uh, strengthening monitoring capacities uh, in, uh, and including climate change issues in our standard survey uh, methods of key habitats and species and providing technical assistance for sustainable uh, national programs and also including uh, new indicators in our state of marine environment uh, process assessment process related to climate change uh, uh, impacts on, on, on ecosystem protection and restoration. Bersiga has already a specific regional action plans for conservation of coral reefs, mangroves, and sea grass, and the MBA network uh, coverage uh, and manage, uh, management effectiveness. Uh, also, we have some capacity building and uh, projects in this regard, which will be covered by my colleague, Dr. Maher, uh, in the next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, <coughs> uh, also, Versica developed technical guidelines uh, on ground restoration projects for mangroves and coral uh, reefs, and, uh, and has, has also uh, implemented or organized uh, training and coordination workshops for inclusion of coastal and marine-based uh, uh, solutions in the NDCs of the member states in the region. Uh, Versiga uh, uh, had implemented an in, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, initiative on uh, 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 blue carbon in the region, uh, addressing regional and national policies, assessments, and capacity building workshops on blue, blue carbon, uh, on, uh, and also implemented on-ground projects of restoration uh, in the member states, and has also uh, a special awareness and outreach materials, including video films, left leaflets, posters, and also assessments on blue carbon resources in the region. Uh, concerning the regional uh, projects, uh, Bersiga has also worked with, with partners uh, in, in, in addressing uh, activities, addressing uh, climate change, building resilience. For example, the strategic ecosystem management project in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, implemented in collaboration with the World Bank in the region during uh, 20, uh, 2014 to 2019 has worked uh, on MBA, improving MBA management, effective uh, support, uh, ecosystem uh, resilience, and also on uh, uh, demonstrating alternative livelihood options based on sustainable fishery, ecotourism, and solar uh, energy solutions in selected uh, pilot sites in the region including also uh, <coughs> uh, community-based uh, activities. Uh, for future projects, we have now uh, two projects, uh, uh, two regional projects. One is sustainable fishery development in, in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, uh, S fish projects in collaboration with the World Bank. And this work to strengthen regional mechanism for sustainable uh, fishery and agriculture development, which also uh, 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 target also fishery, uh, fisheries ready uh, climate change and uh, building resilience uh, to climate change fishery and agriculture sector. 
<coughs> Another project is the inclusive approach for harnessing system services and sustainable building economy in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden region is implemented, uh, supported by GF and will be implemented uh, in, the, uh, in 2023 to 2027. And this will, uh, this project support transition to, to sustainable blue economy, which also consider climate change uh, measures and climate change adaptation and mitigation <coughs> in the development of blue economy sectors. And it, it will also build knowledge management for sustainable blue economy and communication and monitoring. Also, in conclusion, uh, the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden region has high potential for coastal marine ecosystem and nature-based solutions based on the marine ecosystems. Basically, uh, regular efforts on ecosystem and nature-based solutions uh, has built on the existing programs and projects of, of Versiga and also uh, synergy with several national and regional initiatives and uh, the coastal marine and marine uh, climate actions are well included in, or well considered in the uh, nationally determined contributions of uh, Versica member states, which provide uh, also for effective coordination and collaboration at regional level, addressing ecosystem-based adaptation uh, with co mitigation benefits in the, in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Abdullah Raddadi. Dr. Abdullah Raddadi is the advisor for sustainability and climate change deputyship from the Ministry of Energy, Saudi Arabia, and he will be talking about green Saudi Arabia and green Middle East initiatives. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Ziad introduced me, I'm uh, Abdullah Raddadi. I work with the Ministry of Energy, uh, the Deputy Chief of Climate uh, Change. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Persiga for uh, uh, arranging this event. Uh, it's an honor to be a speaker here. Uh, COP27 is an event bringing nations from around the world together under one roof to advance global climate ambition by inspiring joint activities at the local, regional, and international level. Along with the COP, Sharm Sheikh also hosted the Saudi Green Initiative and the Middle East Green Initiative just last week. These initiatives are natural extensions of the Saudi Vision 2030 as it works on including all segments of society and in drawing green future by activating the role of public and private sector and enabling citizens to contribute to achieving ambitions on, on, on the national level. This, e this evening, I'm going to shed the light on the Saudi, in both so the Saudi and Middle East Green Initiative, which were launched last year in 2021 by uh, His uh, Royal Highness, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. I will start with the SGI, the Saudi Green Initiative, which is an ambitious national initiative for Saudi Arabia. This is only on the local national level, which, is, which aims to improve the quality of life and protect future generations. The kingdom has taken decisive steps toward more sustainable future. This initiative unites environmental protection energy transition and sustainability programs within the kingdom with the overarching aim of offsetting and reducing emissions, increasing the kingdom's use of clean energy and addressing climate change. The SEI has three main targets. The first one is to reduce 270, 287 million tons of CO2 equivalents of greenhouse em uh, gas emissions. The second one is to plant 10 billion trees. And the third one, which is more uh, re related to this uh, session, is to raise the level of protected land and sea in Saudi Arabia to 
by working in partnership with internationally leading biodiversity protection organizations, this ambition target will ensure the abundant wildlife, the pristine land landscape, will continue to define the natural ecosystem in the kingdom. And I was happy to hear from the previous speaker that there is actually alignment between Persiga and other nations, and other uh, domestic and regional nations that are in line with the Saudi Green Initiative as well as the Middle East Green Initiative. The SCI will achieve the target to protect 30% of the land uh, and sea through phased establishment of protected areas. At present, dozens of initiatives run by government entities, NGOs, and the private sector organization are working all toward this goal. The protected area covers a variety of geographies, including desert, forests, mountains, and coastal areas. Currently, this initiative, or this program, the Saudi Green Initiative, the SGI, has more than 60 initiatives to help reach the three targets under the SGI to achieve long-lasting positive change. Initiatives range from afforestation and biodiversity to emission reductions and uh, emission, to emission reductions and establishing new protected areas. Under the SCI, Saudi Arabia is delivering, again, its own inspirations to create a greener future for all and putting action and investments behind the country's commitment to sustainable development. So far, the, the total amount of investment in the SCI is around 700 billion Saudi Riyal. As part of the SCI, various entities and organizations across Saudi Arabia help to, help to scale up national climate action and create new initiatives. The SCI efforts engage stakeholders across the private sector, and this is very crucial in order to meet the climate goals. Those stakeholders are carefully selected to ensure their goals and ambition align with the level of the ambition of the Saudi Green Initiative. Example of those initiatives, as may, uh, some of you may have heard, is the energy mix, which is to have 50% of the energy mix uh, in Saudi Arabia renewable, and the other 50% in gas. This is by 2030. Uh, another uh, initiative is the liquid displacement, which, where the kingdom is going to displace one, billion, one million barrel of liquid fuel by 2030, and this is a reduction of 95% from current status. I'm not going through the other initiatives, there's too many of them, but I'm going to move to the MGI now, which is a first-led, which is the first of its kind, regional-led alliances. The MGI works to help to overcome climate challenge through amplified and enhanced regional collaboration. It provides ambitious, ambitious and clearly defined roadmap for regional climate actions, ensuring to coordinate between localized and internationally based uh, entities to the specific way that the, the, the goal behind it is to have to collaborate, to have a collaboration, to have, uh, to have the same goal, and this goal is aligned between all entities. By increasing this, increasing this regional collaboration and creating the infrastructure needed to reduce the emission and protect the environment, the Middle East Green Initiative can amplify the impact of the global fight against, against climate change. Now, those countries covered by the MGI are some of the hottest and driest on Earth, areas that already seen the impact of climate change through raising temperature and extreme weather events. This particular set of circumstances requires a specific and regionally-led approach. No country can work to, toward solving this, uh, this issue but on its own. Saudi Arabia will do its part as a, as a G20 economy and a significant contributor to the climate action globally to make sure that the climate solutions needed in the Middle East in particular, and the North Africa, of course, are considered, those solutions needed are considered in the global uh, scale. Like the SCI, the Middle, East, the Middle East Green Initiative had targets. Precisely, it has two targets. The first one is to plant 40 billion trees across the Middle East, equivalent to 5% of the global afforestation target, and restoring an area of equivalent of 200 million hectares of degraded land. Achieving this target 
will help to generate new employment opportunities and strengthen the, the resilience of remote communities. In addition, the trees will provide numerous other benefits, such as stabilizing soil, protecting against flood and dust storms, and helping reduce CO2 emissions by 2.5% of the global level. The second target of the MGI is support the region to reduce and eliminate emissions equivalent to 670 million tons annually. Saudi Arabia aimed to bring together regional stakeholders to achieve more than 60% reduction of emissions from regional carbon, hydrocarbon production. To achieve this, the MGI will facilitate collaboration on the highest level of government to enable businesses and civil society to, to scale up carbon capture, invest in the green economy, and encourage innovation and renewables. Several initiatives was, were launched in, in, uh, during this, this summit. One of them was the CCE Regional Collaboration. It's a platform that's already online now. The other one is the CCE Fund, which is a, region, a regional fund directed toward investing in clean technology such as CCOS, hydro hydrogen, and nature-based solution. Ladies and gentlemen, I would encourage you to visit our exhibit here in Sharm Sheikh, which we had at, during this cup, where you can see every single initiative of the 60s. You can see illustrations of those initiatives. You can see people and discuss what's happening on the ground with people who actually work there. So I highly encourage you to go there and visit the, the summit. It's just five minute drive from here. Again, I thank Persga for this invitation and uh, I hope a success for this event. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Very informative presentation. And uh, let our next speaker is Dr. Maher Amr. Dr. Maher is the coordinator for MPA Network and Biodiversity in uh, Persiga. And he will be talking about the role of regional MBA's network in climate change adaptation and mitigation. So please, the floor um, is yours. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. <coughs> uh, this talk, I will throw some light on uh, Persica uh, intervention related to, and the activities related to uh, marine protected areas. And also, we will uh, know how uh, will man manage marine protected area, uh, help people and uh, marine ecosystem for adapting climate change uh, threats like sea, le sea level rise, intensification of storms, uh, shifting in species distribution, uh, decline in secondary productivity, and the cumulative effect and the synergy. And also, we will explore the role of uh, managed marine uh, coastal marine ecosystem in uh, climate change mitigation by carbon sequestration and uh, storage. Okay, the benefit of marine protected area is uh, wide. It, it support uh, uh, and improve ecosystem function, maintain and reestablish ecological structure functions and the process that support economic and the social uh, uses and the values mitigate the effect of climate variability and the change, contribute toward the climate change uh, adaptation by, to, by protecting uh, the coastal ecosystem and they protect essential ecosystem surfaces. Uh, uh, <coughs> From this point, Bersica member state in 2005 signing a protocol concerning the biological conservation of biological diversity and the establishment of marine protected area in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. The objective of this protocol is the capacity building in all aspects of planning and management, sustainable uses of the marine resources occurred in the region, and engage the stockholders in all processes of management and conservation all prime examples of biodiversity and enhance the public awareness of the biodiversity and the resources, and uh, <coughs> also make some research uh, 
uh, activities. After this protocol, Mirska uh, uh, formed uh, Mirska member state formed a network composed of 12 MPAs distributed along all countries in the Russian pattern and uh, composed of all important and the critical sites in the region. But now uh, we, we acknowledge that all MBAs inside Persica region, Persica member state, are within the, the network. <coughs> to implement this uh, protocol, Persica made many intervention and activities. Firstly, we, Persica and the member state surveyed the all marine ecosystem in the region and the important site and the prepare original master plan of the uh, network or master plan. This master plan of the network based on site specific master plan and the, uh, or to prepare site specific management plan for, for site and the review update this management plan and the review with it uh, for uh, about five years. <coughs> Recently, Persica prepared an integrated management plan for uh, a site in Sudan uh, that nominated by UNESCO as a uh, World National Heritage Site under the theme of, uh, uh, of uh, man and the biosphere. <coughs> in order to know how do we want to be and whether this management plan has achieved their objective, Persica annually <coughs> evaluate the management effectiveness of the network. <coughs> the management effectiveness is the assessment of how, how well protected areas are, are being managed. <coughs> this process, uh, we achieved this process by the World Bank scorecard for uh, management effectiveness tracking tool methods. And we find that there is an improvement of the objectives of the network, but more improvement occurred as Persica that has many intervention and activities. But uh, some uh, objective uh, st still now not satisfactory or insufficient for the management. Uh, Persica to bar also to, pre uh, to prepare and to uh, review the management effectiveness of the uh, network, uh, support uh, the MBA's network with uh, Management tools, <coughs> management tools, and implement some on-ground approaching. The management tools we uh, support the MBAs in most countries with uh, surveying uh, equipment, uh, diving set, camera, GPS, and the boots for uh, patrolling, control, and the surveillance. Glass boots for the locals inside the MBAs. Uh, outreach materials and the training the managers. Since 2005, we trained about 1,700 of managers and officials inside Bersica region, and also installed some uh, solar units in the offices of the MBAs, of uh, school, uh, <coughs> solar units in the school and the hospital inside the MBAs, and also we installed centralized solar planet in some villages inside the uh, MPAs. Of the ground activities that we implement in uh, basic uh, MPAs, we installing mooring buoys in some uh, uh, submerged reef to uh, uh, protect this reef from human activities and increasing their resilience. So we installed about 50 mooring buoys in the coastal reef, submerged reef in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and about 20 a mooring boys in the uh, Aqaba Marine Park in uh, Jordan. Also, some uh, on ground project in, inside the MPAs we restore and rehabilitate some mangrove standards in uh, MPAs, MPA in Djibouti. Well, so, so uh, the rule of marine protected area of Persica for mitigate adaptation and the mitigation of climate change will effectively we can see uh, we can uh, uh, see that will effectively manage MBAs, help the marine ecosystem and be able to adapt 
Uh, to, to, so for some issue from uh, climate change, like civil rights, uh, civil rights, rough sea condition and the storms, shift in species distribution, and uh, decline of secondary productivity, and the synergies between human activities and the, uh, the climate change. Regarding to the civil uh, re, uh, sea level rise, the intake and the well connected uh, wetland, coastal wetland, and the mudflat and the biogenic reefs offer protection against climate change and uh, against sea level rise and the promoting uh, ecosystem based adaptation to safeguard the uh, people. Uh, infrastructure and the property against adverse climate change uh, threats. MBAs protect disease uh, coastal ecosystems uh, such, um, from this resource such as uh, uh, protecting them from over harvesting, dredging, and the coastal uh, development, <coughs> helping safeguard their function as a coastal defenses. All these coastal uh, wetland. Uh, increase in elevation through time, so adapt to sea uh, level rise. Regarding to the intensification, or, uh, intensification of storms and the rough sea conditions, well protected coastal ecosystem reduce risks from storms and uh, coastal flooding. Large wetland with dense uh, vegetation, stabilized shorelines, attenuate with energy, and accumulate. Uh, sediment more effective than uh, the degraded uh, wetland. Regarding the shift distribution, the increasing in surface temperature and the changing in salinity and the density profile, the current, the main current, global main current regime changed, and this is uh, affect the distribution of species. A regional MBA network uh, provide stepping <coughs> stones for dispersal uh, and considered as a safe uh, landing zone for species to colonize and the refugia for that species uh, 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 that species enabled to move. Also, MBAs uh, increase the genetic diversity inside the uh, MBAs that promoting adaptability and uh, resilience. According to the uh, primary and the secondary productivity decline uh, as effect of climate change, effectively managed MBAs play an important role for uh, fisheries management, uh, rebuilding uh, exploited stocks and uh, degraded habitats by protecting spooning nursery and uh, feeding grounds. And uh, regarding to the synergy and the synchronization of climate change with the anthropogenic uh, effectiveness, the coastal and the marine ecosystem already under uh, multiple anthropogenic stresses besides the impact of climate change. There is a synergy between anthropogenic effect and the climate change, well-managed MBAs, limiting direct anthropogenic stresses, thus enable species to recover, reproduce, and grow to be more resilient to climate change. Regarding to the mitigation of climate change, of the marine ecosystem, or coastal marine ecosystem to climate change by sinking carbon, coastal wetland store organic carbon in sediment for millennia. The three coastal ecosystem mangrove, seagrass, and salt marshes and wetland, especially linking intertidal habitats which un un with an unvegetated mudflat and the sandbars habitat that may sink large amount of organic carbon. MBAs are not only protecting this habitat, but they maintain and enhance this spatially connected ecosystems. In conclusion, we can uh, reported that MPS networks are a viable low technology, cost effective adaptation, uh, adaptation uh, adaptive strategy, will yield uh, world, uh, multiple co benefits from national, regional, 
and the global scale. The establishment of extensive MBAs network can help mitigate climate change through the multiplication of biological responses to protection. And finally, the role of MBAs network and the role of Persica MBAs network in protection of coastal habitat often offers a more cost-effective solution than habitat restoration or the engineering solution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maher. Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Mohammed Ismail. Uh, he is Persica Ecosystem Valuation and Sensitive Habitat Coordinator, and he will be talking about regional efforts for conservation and resilience of coral reefs. So the floor is yours, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for attending so late. I have two good news for you. First of all, I don't have a presentation. <laughs> Secondly, there is food and drinks outside, <laughs> okay? So, um, so hopefully you're cheered out now. Uh, I'm gonna talk about coral reef, but uh, allow me to play a very short video, and then I will continue to talk about what Persiga have been doing recently in terms of the conservation of coral reef, okay? Sorry, technical issue like usual. Climate change, global warming, coral bleaching, raising sea level, food shortage, loss of biodiversity. The role of science is to bring us closer to reality, but sometimes reality is so dark and depressing. Are we throwing the towel on climate change? Is this the message we are sending to our new generations? The message should change. The message should be a message of hope. Hope that both humans and corals will survive climate change. The Red Sea is a sea of hope. The Red Sea is offering hope for all coral reefs across the universe. Research showed that Red Sea corals are super corals. Red Sea corals are resilient to climate change. Hope is not far away. Hope is here in the Red Sea. The Regional Organization for the Conservation of the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden is working with its member states not only to protect our valuable coral reef resources, but to restore its habitat and making sure our coral reef of the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden will be there for generations to come. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about research first. As research in Egypt and other places around the Red Sea, Kaos in Saudi Arabia and other places internationally have actually showed that coral reefs of the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden are very resilient to climate change or to raise of sea temperature at least. These corals have survived events of mass bleaching. It does not offer hope only for the Red Sea, it offers hope for the rest of the world. That gives a huge importance for the coral reef in the Red Sea. It's not only important for the region, not only important for our member states, it will have a global importance for everywhere else. Therefore, the conservation and our efforts to protect corals in the Red Sea is not only on a regional level, but it's also on a global level. We've been working in different projects. I mean, we have uh, been in the building capacity uh, program. We have been building capacity for the member states on how to create sensitivity maps for coral reef, how to conserve coral reef. We've been offering programs for valuation of natural resources, which is a very important thing that we've been doing at Persia recently, because you cannot protect your resources unless you have a value for these resources. And this value must have an economic impact. So the Minister of Economics and Finance will understand that these coral reefs are not only pretty, but they have a financial value. They have an importance that will need to be protected. We have a new project that will offer also restoration projects for damaged areas, for areas that were impacted by human impact, that Bersiga will actually help in the restoration projects of these natural habitat. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Mohammed Zahran. Dr. Mohammed is the Mari uh, Dr. Mohammed is the president of the National Authority for Remote Sensing and the Science in Egypt. Dr. Mohammed will be addressing the marine ecosystem-based adaptation and mitigation in Egypt. So the floor is yours, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you, Chairman, for your good presentation for myself. I am so happy to present this lecture for you, Climate Change and Coastal Ecosystem Adaptation in Egypt Case Studies. Climate change in Egypt could be, uh, negative impacts could be recognized in seven uh, factors like uh, sea level rise, salt water intrusion, drought, flash floods, water scarcity, heat waves, and cold waves. Climate change, as, as you see in this picture, Egypt has uh, in the north coast about uh, 1,500 kilometers and the east about uh, 1,700 kilometers. And both has negative impact if uh, the sea rise level is get high. And the cod uh, has many uh, side effects on Egyptian costs uh, by uh, the impact of uh, climate change. And of course, this uh, climate change impact could be affect Egyptian country direct or indirect uh, as in heat waves. And this will affect health uh, conditions, food security and energy consumption, tourism and infrastructure. And of course, Nile, uh, Nile flow of, uh, fluctuation will affect health conditions and food security. And sea level rise, of course, will affect the migration of the Bedouin peoples uh, live in the north and east of Egypt. Egypt bought a plan for adaptation, and this plan consists of six uh, sequential steps. First of all, we have to address the climate change risk and, uh, for, for mid and long term. And then we have to build the policy and the capacity building efforts uh, for uh, the Egyptian. After that, we have to decrease the climate change side effect by improving institutional and technical capacity of climate change uh, adaptation planning. After that, we have to integrate the climate change adaptation into national and sectoral planning and uh, budgeting. And at last, of course, we have to catalyze investment in climate change adaptation. If we focus on the effect of climate change on coastal zones, we have three targets. We have to reduce climate change associated risks and disasters. And of course, we have to capacity building of the Egyptian society and adapt to climate change and the associated risk and disaster also. And we have to enhance national and regional partnership in managing crisis and disaster related to climate change and the reduction of associated risk. NARS use the satellite images for remote sensing to monitor the, the water level in the Mediterranean and Red Sea by using a high resolution spatial satellite images captures at associated time interval. And on the other hand, it is also possible to study and calculate the rate of beach retreat and quantitative estimation of the eroded area of the beaches. In the water resources and the irrigation, we have three targets also. We have to increase investment in the modern irrigation system. We have to cooperate with Nile Basin countries to reduce the water evaporation and increase river capacity. And we have to develop national policies to encourage citizens on water use realization, rationalization. Egyptian government take decision to make jump for all uh, the lying canals and the drains in Egypt, and this will reduce the water uh, leak, and of course, we will keep the water, which is very expensive nowadays. In NARS, we have developed a smart system based on artificial intelligence and Internet of Things to monitor the water discharge from the drilled wells and 
apply the Egyptian regulation or contract between the customer and the governmental or uh, service provider. This system is tested in high level authority in Egypt and approved to be applied in at least 52,000 uh, drilled well in Egypt. On the other hand, Egypt take care uh, for uh, maybe overflow from high dam coming from Nile because of climate change. And the state has taken a particular measurement uh, and deal with the possible increase of Nile waters affiliated by climate change. And we repair, we repair Toshka. And now we have at least five uh, artificial lakes in Toshka to be uh, as a store uh, of water reservoir. In the agriculture sector, we have also five pillars. We have to build an effective institutional system to manage climate change associated crisis and disaster at the national level. And we have to activate generic diversity of plant species with maximum productivity. And I could confirm here that Egypt and groups, some groups we have at least 2,000, uh, uh, sorry, 20, 22 uh, productivity, or maybe you can, you can say we can, we can duplicate the productivity of groups in some plants in Egypt. And of course, we have to achieve biological diversity at all uh, life, stock, fishery, and, uh, and, and the polarity elements to protect them and ensure food security. And as adaptation of Egyptian uh, government, we, ha we, we do in increase the, uh, the agriculture area by using the smart tools for uh, uh, irrigation system like pivot system associated with wireless sensor no network to control and uh, optimize the use of amount of water in different uh, area of the land because the, the pivot standard area is 150 feet down and this area does not have the same uh, level, the same soil, but it is, could be classified to arid, semi-arid or wet, and we have to optimize the amount of water delivered from the nozzles of pivot system. And we did this in, uh, in NARS. Also, Egypt creates a new Delta project with 2 million Fedan, Fedan and this area uh, will be uh, irrigated by three sources of water, the water desalination from uh, the Mediterranean Sea, or water treatment from the waste water or from the, the drilled wells. In the agriculture sector in NARS, we develop a smart system also for smart agriculture. This system accommodate all the variables of, uh, agricult of, uh, of sensor related to agriculture. And this system is well installed and approved and, and now it's applied in Salhiya uh, farms. And uh, as you see in this picture, this system is fully standalone because the smart tool is powered by a battery. This battery has energy storage enough for 10 successful days without sun. And we use a small solar panel with a charge regulator to charge this battery. By means, this system does not need any technical help from the farmer in the, in the fields. Also, the health sector has side effect maybe coming from uh, climate change. And we have to identify the potential health risks and uh, as a result of climate change. Also, we have to raise community awareness about the climate change risk and the means of adaptation. And we have to increase the efficiency of health care sector and improve the quality of health service in dealing with climate change. And at last, we have support the Ministry of Health efforts to improve the social and economic status and the population characterization or characteristics. In the tourist se uh, se uh, sector, of course, this sector also could be affected by climate change. By reduce, we, we have to reduce climate change risk in touristic area, and we have to engage uh, users in supporting the proposed strategy, and we have to support periodical monitoring and observation system and the follow-up uh, bodies, and we have to raise environment awareness and cooperate with international bodies, incorporate 
disaster risks within the planets to promote suitable tourism in Egypt and we have already to make capacity building. The impact of uh, climate change and tourism could be listed here. Maybe the acidic rains can, be, can have side effect on temples or mummies, and uh, also rising temperature will lead uh, to bleaching of coral uh, reefs, which, uh, which are natural wealth that tourists uh, flock to. And also the effect of, of increased, increased heat or uh, ar archaeological areas and an increase is supported dust and the humidity will, will affect the, the, the health state of the temples. I think this picture does not need any clarification because this is the consequence of acidic rains uh, on the tourists. And in ours, of course, we, 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 do, we develop a smart system also to measure the air quality and estimate uh, the amount of pollution in the air that could affect these temples and to make prediction control or prediction maintenance before uh, it, it reaches this catastrophic damage. Thank you for your hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, Professor Mohammed Zahran. And uh, now our second speaker is uh, Mr. Dini Abdullah. He is the Secretary General of Ministry of Urban Planning and Environment and Tourist in Djibouti. And he will be talking about coastal ecosystem-based adaptation and mitigation in How Djibouti. So the floor yes. is yours, Doctor. Okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, before I want to uh, apologize for my, for my bad English, it's because I come from a uh, French-speaking country, so it is very difficult for me to, to speak in English, but uh, I will try. I want to uh, speak to two things uh, before uh, flood and after that about mangrove. The main uh, impact, uh, one of the main impact of climate change in Djibouti is flood in coastal area, especially uh, cities in coastal area are uh, affected by uh, flood. So why we, we try to protect these uh, cities by dig, by dig, dams, by dig, by dam. So we built uh, in Tajura city uh, one uh, dam. This dam is uh, made with a gabion wall with a ripe prep for protection. Length of, the, of, of this dike is one kilometer and 700 kilometers. High is three meters meter and the base is five meters. This, uh, this dike, this dam, dike protects nearly 60% of the people of Tajura city is approximately 10,000 people. So when we, when we, Djibouti, uh, when we affected by, uh, by flood in, in October 19, 2019, this, uh, this dike, dike helped it to protect the population of uh, the city of Tajura during this flood. So it was very uh, effective to protect the population uh, about the risks of uh, flood. Now I want to speak to with another subject about uh, mangrove. As you know, mangrove is very important for fisheries. And so why we try to, to plant mangrove in the coastal area. So before we, we, we put in place nursery for, man, for mangrove, and the, the, 
this, uh, this restoration activity for mangrove is implemented in near Tajura city. Uh, the restorative the plants are largely mangrove and some uh, Abyssinia, Abyssinia marina. 14,000 plants we have, uh, we are replanted. This project is funded by GZF, but uh, the project is not about, uh, about the coastal area. The main activities of the project is in rural area. It's about agriculture and water. But a small component is used to protect a coastal area city from flood and to replant mangrove. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dini. And uh, I think by this, we concluded the speakers. Now we have, as I said before, we have three interventions. Uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Leah Segart. And she, uh, as I introduced her before, she is the practice manager, uh, environment, natural resources, blue economy, and Middle East, for the Middle East and North Africa region from the World Bank. So the floor is yours, Doctor. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Seat. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And I really wanted to take the opportunity to thank Persega for the invitation. We have been working for more than 20 years very closely with Persega and its member states. So it's, it's really a delight to be here. So first of all, let me, let me tell you that um, the the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden is particularly close to my heart, not last or least because I also got married in Aden at the shore of the, the Gulf of Aden. So for me, it's, it's quite close to my heart. So first, uh, I think I also wanted to thank the, the presenters because I personally learned a lot uh, from all of you on, on all the activities that are going on in the various Persica member states. And for us at the World Bank and, and working with many of you very closely, is, it's the, really the importance of marine and coastal environments because large parts of the uh, population really rely in terms of economic development on the marine and coastal resources of your countries, particularly as, as was also mentioned by, by the, the speakers, may it be on one side on the, on the tourism side, but also on, on the fishery side. And, and particularly the fishing industry is, is of importance to countries in, in the Persica region or in Persica member states. And what we have also heard today, climate change impacts particularly on the marine biodiversity and in ecosystems. And I'm, I was particularly pleased to learn about the resilience of the corals in, in the Red Sea, and, and which is quite, a, quite a, a breath of fresh air to me and, and was very good to hear. But also we, we see that climate change particularly impacts on marine biodiversity and ecosystems, but particularly also then threatens fisheries contribution to food security in many countries in the region. Um, and on the other hand, and that's why we work very closely with, uh, with Persica and also with the member states, given that also fisheries are shared transboundary regional good that can be tapped on one hand in a sustainable manner, on one hand to further improve on food security, but also increase um, to address the resilience to, to climate change. But on the other hand also that while the ecosystems both on the marine and, and coastal side are very closely interlinked, there, is, there are also countries in the region face a lot of challenges in terms at the, at the local level, may it be on fisheries management, may it be on uh, institutional capacity, but also business environment that may be fragile, 
but also impacts that are more regional of nature, and that's why it's so important to have a close collaboration amongst the member states of Persica, may it be due to climate change, may it be due to pollution, may it be also in terms of illegal fisheries. Um, and only by jointly addressing um, regional impacts, uh, it is important to really come to joint solutions. And for that reason, um, as was mentioned earlier, we have very closely, over 20 years, very closely worked at the national level with many countries in the region, but also uh, through Persica, where we started already 20 years ago on a regional project on the implementation of the strategic action plan in the Persica region, where we built together with Persica a solid platform for the collaboration aimed at improving the coastal and marine environment. That was then followed up by a second phase working on the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden on a strategic ecosystems management project where we worked closely on um, incentive-based ecosystems um, approach for managing marine and uh, resources, but also establishing an operational environment for managing regional marine protected areas. And just recently, in, in June of this year, we, we have approved a new regional program that we are implementing with our partner Persica at a regional level for the management of uh, fish resources along the entire value chain where we invite through Persica uh, member states to exchange experiences, exchange lessons learned, but also further strengthen regional cooperation for the management of marine resources, in particular fisheries. And in addition, where we are implementing um, activities at the local level and we're working here with one of the from one country uh, has already started joining this platform so here we are working with Yemen in revitalizing the fishing industry in a sustainable manner along the entire value chain and in order to improve uh, um, the, the fishing industry as a, a extremely important economic a driver and business resource, which also needs to be managed in a sustainable manner. And we hope that many other countries from the Persica member states will join us, both at the regional level, as well as at the local level for implementation, at, and depending on the national priorities, because very obviously each Persica member state has different national priorities in order to uh, strengthen uh, the fisheries management. So looking forward, I'm really delighted to continue working with all of you in order to maximize, maximize the sustainable development of the region's blue economy, which is really a driver and a critical backbone of the economies of many of the countries. And only by acting together, we can create a more resilient, more inclusive, but also a more sustainable society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leah. Actually, uh, we would like to express our really thanks and appreciation to the World Bank. The World Bank has been very supportive for Persica. We had very continuous and uh, long-lasting support. We had a project, same project, which we concluded uh, two years ago, and it was very successful. It was very beneficial for our region. And now we just started uh, a new project on sustainable fishery. The project, again, is uh, of great importance to our, to our region and to our member states. So we really uh, appreciate your uh, cooperation, your support, and we are very pleased to, that you joined us in this uh, side event. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, now I will uh, give the floor to Dr. Salim is here. Dr. Mohammed Salim, yes. Dr. Mohammed Salim will deliver the statement on behalf of Dr. Uh, uh, Ali Abu Sinna. So you are, you, are, uh, <laughs> you are ready, Dr.
Uh -huh. Anyway, if you want, you can say a few words. I think he's not uh, coming. Oh, oh, okay. Let me give the floor to Dr. Mahmoud Hanafi. So we allow more time for... No, no, you come here, please. Uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Mahmoud Hanafi, and we will listen to him. After that, we will listen to Dr. Mohammed uh, Salim. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ziyad. Just uh, in a few minutes, uh, I have some comments regarding my experience working for 35 years on research and management of the living resources of the Red Sea. You know, the first lesson I learned from the uh, dealing in terms of conservation and development in the Red Sea, which is it will be never uh, come with effective uh, conservation without raising the value of the biodiversity, the economical value of the biodiversity. And I'm sure tourism does this. And we have very, very high valuable of biodiversity as, you know, a touristic products we are selling, you know. Because of this, I think we have um, effective network of protected areas. We have uh, environmental impact assessment system for all of the projects along the coast of the Red Sea. Uh, you know, one of the points which I am proud about, this is the only sea or the only area which consider, we considered as a zero discharge sea. If we know that 80% of the wastewater or sewage producing by human is just at the end reached to the ocean. So I think this is very important point. Second lesson I learned from uh, my experience in the Red Sea that if the development preceded the effective conservation will end with some challenges. We will end with, as you see in the, our major cities like Sharm el Sheikh, Hergada, we have very intensive development and very limited and valuable resources. So we have a problem, we, I call it overuse of biodiversity. Overuse of biodiversity in, in, in tourism. We have in some diving sites, a diving rate exceeded 200,000 dive per site per year, and this is very, very high, comparing with the sustainable diving. Uh, for this, I think we have a project now uh, to create a new diving site, uh, uh, to sink some wrecks, uh, to reduce the potential of diving on the natural diving site in the area of Orgada, for example. Uh, in addition to the, this, I think we have, uh, because of this, uh, in terms of overuse of biodiversity, the fisheries. This is one. Red Sea is not, Egyptian Red Sea is not a fishing ground. It's not a valuable fishing ground. This is oligotrophic, uh, very poor, low productivity, and the value even of the live fish is more important and more high than the, as a catch. So I think we, we started to reduce the recreational uh, uh, sport fishing or sport fishing by at least 50% the potential of fishing or the, uh, the catch by 50%. I hope that we are going to continue this. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, Climate change, my colleague, Dr. Mohammed Smaidi, was talking about this, uh, the climate change and our coral resilience. We have more than 50 publications and the articles talking about that the coral reef of the Egyptian Red Sea could be one of the last, if not, if not the last, it could be one of the last refuge for coral worldwide. And this is now very, very clear. Uh, what does this mean? It means this is one of the challenges, actually, that we have to, to pay more attention and more effort to conservation. And it's not a task of Egypt. It's, it's now a task, it's a global task, actually, because this is a humankind, valuable, and very productive ecosystem, which many, many you know, scientists believe that at the end of this century, coral will be this 
you know, disappeared from the earth. According to the scientific facts, we found that even raising of temperature by 1.5, it will not impact our coral. And this is very, very clear. Uh, so I call it just, I, 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 you know, I call this the, I call it the great French grief of Egypt, like the Great Barrier in Australia, for many reasons. First of all, this could be one of the last coral refuge worldwide, which is human, it's very important for humankind. Secondly, it's very valuable as economical, you know, uh, as a base for the uh, econom as economical value, not just for Egypt, but even for Europe. It's, it's global, even the, the economical value of the coral reef and the Red Sea, uh, and Egyptian Red Sea is, is you know, uh, valuable, uh, you know, globally, you know, even supporting the economy of Europe. Uh, I think the role of the civil society in conservation, this is something very, very important, co-management. I'm working with an NGO, uh, uh, Hergada uh, Environmental Conservation and Preserva uh, uh, Protection and Conservation Association, HIPCA. And we're working very closely with the Ministry of Tourism. We have the largest mooring installation worldwide. We have 14 mooring installations to avoid anchorage of boats, of pleasure boats on the reef. And this is, this is very brown. We are working very closely with the community, but based on that it will be very hard to attract the local community to be part of the conservation process unless they get some benefits through sharing benefits or, you know, getting benefit from the conservation process. Uh, we work it very closely with uh, the Red Sea protected areas and, and uh, uh, some villages along the coast and even with the support of Bersica to, you know, uh, to convert the, the income of this community from fisheries, from consumption use of biodiversity to be part of the tourism industry in con non-consumption use of biodiversity. And this is, you know, we, by this way we improve their lifestyle. They are very keen to be part of the conservation process. And at the end we raise their ownership to, this, uh, uh, to, uh, to our resource. Uh, thank you very much, and I think, you know, I don't like, uh, and thank you, Dr. Ziad. Thank you. thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud. And we always uh, learn from your experience, and we appreciate joining us in this side event. Uh, now I will give the floor to Dr. Mohammed Salim. He is the director of uh, Marine Protected Area in Egypt, so, and he will talk on behalf of Dr. Uh, Ali Abu Sinna, the head of the uh, in, in environment, uh, uh, environment in, in, in Egypt. So please, I will give the floor to you. Thank you. I don't want to repeat what just Dr. Mahmoud said because he almost covered everything uh, related to what's going on along the Red Sea. But I want to stress on the uh, fisheries uh, issue because now we have very, very big challenge, especially in the north part of the Red Sea, because we don't, we, I, I think we, we have to differentiate between the Gulf of Aden and the, uh, the Red Sea because just as Dr. Mahmoud said, it's very, very poor in terms of productivity. And because of the development we have now along most of the coastal area of at least the Egyptian Sea coast now, I believe we have a big uh, problem with the fish population. Most of the economically and uh, ecologically important fish species almost uh, declined to a critical level. Now we are going to take action to restore this population, but it, for us it is very, very uh, big a challenge to do. But this is why I need, we might need to reassess the uh, 
fish species population especially targeted by uh, fishing, local fishermen and also commercial uh, fishing. Otherwise, we might lose such very, very sensitive habitat because of this even before we reach the level of uh, we expect from the global warming. This is why for us, I mean, along the Egyptian Red Coast and the north part of Red Sea Coast, we should deal it as a, with this area as a fishing ground because almost the productivity is almost zero compared with other area. And uh, the impact of fishing activity, I think it should be considered as one of the most uh, danger impacts might uh, impact the coral reef resources along the Red Sea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed Salim, for sharing the experience of the environmental affairs in Egypt with us, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, now we are still having a few minutes. So if anybody has some inquiries, questions, or comments, so I see uh, Dr. Foda. Dr. Foda. Uh, yeah, Dr. Foda. Again, Dr. Foda is one of our uh, scientists in our region. So let us hear from him. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Zian for sharing this very important uh, meeting and certainly the analysis that uh, have given us uh, a quite spectrum of uh, what's happening in the Red Sea and even the future as well. Having said that, I kept thinking about one or two issues that I would like just to make it clear. Number one, is the issue of nature-based solution. How nature-based solution can be implemented at a time where still many people don't understand what we are talking about. We need to prepare some kind of framework based on the principles of nature-based solution in a way that we could say, yes, indeed, we can implement it in the Red Sea. Otherwise, it will be uh, a kind of talks, whatever. So uh, we have enough information. This is almost the third presentation or side event that I have seen today that they talk about nature conservation, uh, nature-based solution. And tomorrow more will be about nature-based solution uh, in terms of mainstreaming uh, of uh, tourism, uh, investment of, uh, uh, in uh, nature-based solution as well. So, having said that, I have a question for you, lady. Uh, how can we invest in nature-based solution in the Gulf, or the, shall we say, in Bersica region because the issue of financing? At the same time, we need to get something out of this meeting. Can we prepare messages to the president of COP27 and uh, next month in uh, Montreal, where we will have the CBD uh, COP15, what kind of message that we could send them to enhance the whole process of nature-based solution? Otherwise, uh, it will be late. We are in a process of almost more than 10 years now, we keep talking about it. And we have experience, uh, not only in Egypt, but in many other regions, in the Bersaga region and other regions as well, in the north of Africa as well. So we need to develop, deliver a clear message in a way that they have to include nature-based solution in their decisions. It is not enough to say UN decade for blah, 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 uh, declaration. No, we need very clear uh, decision that can be implemented globally and certainly at uh, regional level. Thank you very much. Ah. The other thing which I continue with Mahmoud as well, by the way, most of them, they are my students, you know. <laughs> the issue of global significance of the Egyptian Red Sea Coral Reef. 
It's not only from economic, from environment, and so the future. Because when we talk about nature-based solution, we are talking about actions to protect, sustainably manage resources, uh, ecosystems, whether they are natural or artificial as well. So we deal with man-made uh, ecosystems as well, whether wetlands or whatever, in a way that uh, in the future, these corals will be of very, very valuable from economical point of view. Can we have more protection in terms of more artificial reefs that we can sell them to the rest of the world, for example, where many, many places will have coral bleaching? Can we have more protection in a way that we can increase the whole process in a way that we can declare, we hope we can declare, I wouldn't say it, I would like to say it from Muhammad, I would like to, Muhammad to just mention it, the Egyptian government plan about the importance of the coral reefs in Egypt. Actually, we have good news. Yani we are now in process of declaring the entire coral reef habitats along the Egyptian Red Sea coast as a protected area uh, soon. Within days, uh, inshallah, we will have the de decree from the pre minister to That's declare great. the entire coral reef habitats from Suez to our boundary with Sudan. Uh, as a protected and it will be under the umbrella of the protection law. That's what we have tried for some time now and we tried to convince the government they are ready now to declare it. This is a very good news and this could be used as one of the messages to the president of COP25. Yeah. Yes, Mahmoud, who already... Yes, uh, if you allow me to... No, I think our reef is already recognized globally because, you know, it's declared already as a hope spot. The Great French Grief of Egypt is declared already as a hope spot with the uh, Ocean Agency and uh, Mission Blue. And there will be uh, an event tomorrow uh, to declare this uh, officially. Yeah. It will be, it will be named the Great French Grief. Uh, the Great Fringing Reef. Uh, because we have, I think, the longest well-developed fringing reef in the world, which extends to more than 1,000 kilometers. And there is nothing like this in everywhere in, in other areas. Yeah. And this is why I think it will be a good step towards protecting the entire Red Sea for the Egypt, for the region, and for the world, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa Fawada. Thank you very much again, Professor Mustafa Fawada. Actually, uh, we here tonight, uh, our scientists, which is really, I am very pleased that we have both of them here, and we have a lot of uh, people from different sectors joining us. So uh, now I think we are approaching the uh, end of the time allocated for us. So unfortunately, I don't have time for uh, questions, and it is getting late. So I have to conclude here. So let me thank all of you for coming, although it is very late. So but uh, you attended. So thank you very much. I appreciate coming and participating. And also, I would uh, thank all our speakers uh, Dr. Leia, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Mah Muhammad Hanafi, Mahmoud Hanafi, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Salim, uh, thank you very much. Dr. Abdullah Raddadi, thank you very much. He left. Uh, oh, he's there. <laughs> Dr. Abdullah, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and for participating in this uh, important uh, side event. So thank you all and see you again.